Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the water. How are we doing today? I'm doing great, thank you. I'm doing really great, actually. I, I am, I'm doing awesome. I am heading into a three-week vacation. I've got one week left before I take three weeks off from work. All well, y'all were... Uh, chilling at home during COVID, I was trying to keep my restaurants alive. And so I've just been hitting the ground running since everything happened. And this is uh, kind of, we, we finally turned things around over the last six months. And I'm taking a break. I'm going to breathe a little bit. I am very excited about it. I, uh, I'm kind of in that stage, you know, like pre-vacation where you're trying to think of everything. Well, I'm taking like three weeks. So I am anxious and excited all at the same time. Not only am I taking three weeks, I surprised my wife for a birthday trip. Rachel, who was leading worship here, we are heading to Italy. Yes. I'm very excited about that. I broke the news a few weeks ago and uh, very excited. It was a bucket list for us. We were planning to go there at our 10-year anniversary, and instead we opened up another restaurant. And uh, so three years, four years later... Been married 14 years, yes, 14 years. Four years late, we're making it happen. So extremely excited about that. We're spending about 10 days there, and it's going to be a great time. I am uh, extremely honored to be able to speak on this subject today. We're talking about the church. We're right in the middle of our series of the church. Pastor Max kicked it off last week and really gave a call to, uh, for unity amongst churches and spoke just in, in, it was so beautifully put. It was not only church bodies being unified with each other and not bashing one another, but also within the church communities of people learning to walk in healthy relationship, in healthy confrontation. Highly recommend you listening to that if you missed it last week. It was a great message. But I want us to take a step back a little bit, and we're going to define for a moment what the church truly is. See, I think that when we're talking about the church, we can have this perception or this idea of what church is is or what it's supposed to be based on our modern day understanding of it. But I'm going to go back to the first time that Jesus made the breakout statement about him building his church upon the earth and what, what truly it was that he was talking about. See, it's important for us going forward as we are building the church here on the earth, it's important for us to build it with the intention that he originally intended it to be built. So let's, uh, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Let's see if I can do this one-handed here. Okay, verse... We're going to start in verse 13. I'm sorry for the guys in the back. I think I said verse 15. I'll give you a quick second. Verse 13, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be loosed it shall be whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven he says this to peter he says look upon this revelation that i am the christ this is the revelation that i'm building my church upon i don't care what everybody else says about me i want to hear what you say about me who you say that i am as the christ that is what i am building my church on I'm going to uh, read briefly uh, an excerpt from a 
book called New Testament Words written by William Barclay. The original word in the Greek for church was the word ekklesia. And it's important to understand what this word truly means to see what it is that we are building. Now, we know the, the church is it's, it's local. There are local assemblies. We see it throughout Scripture where Paul wrote to the, the, the Galatians, where he wrote to the church of Ephesus. We know that in Revelation there were letters that were written to the seven churches. But how many know the church is universal? It's not just this church or that church. We are part of a universal, global church, not only global, but also a heavenly church. In 1 Thessalonians, it actually says that there will be a day when Jesus returns that those in heaven and those that are upon the earth will come together in union and together the church will, for the first time, be fully convened as the bride of Christ. It's going to be a beautiful day when Jesus comes down from heaven with the sound of a trumpet. It says that we will meet up in the air. I'm, I hope that happens while I'm already here. Can you imagine just kind of a quick takeoff and we meet up in the air with the rest of the church? I don't know if I'll be excited, scared, like is this really happening or what's happening here? It's going to be a great and glorious day though. Regardless, we're going to be a part of it whether we are here on the earth during that time or whether we are in heaven. We will be united all together as the beautiful bride of Christ. So let me read this real quick. Ecclesia has a Greek background. In the great classical days in Athens, the ecclesia was the convened assembly of the people. It consisted of all of the citizens of the city who had not lost their civic rights. Apart from the fact that its decisions must conform to the laws of the state, its powers were to all intents and purposes unlimited. It elected and dismissed magistrates and directed the policy of the city. This is the understanding that they had when he says, upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia. See, it's important to understand the context of scripture at the time. We oftentimes can read it at face value and interpret it according to what the modern day reality that we are living is in. But he said, look, this is, this is the ecclesia its powers were to all intents and purposes unlimited. It was an assembled group of people, elected and dismissed magistrates, directed the policy of the city. It declared war. It made peace. It contracted treaties and arranged alliances. It elected generals and other military officers. It assigned troops to different campaigns and dispatched them from the city. It was ultimately responsible for the conduct of all military operations. It raised and allocated funds. Two things are interesting to note. First, all its meetings began with prayer and sacrifice. And second, it was a true democracy. Its two great watchwords were equality and freedom. It was an assembly where everyone had an equal right. But not only an equal right, everyone had an equal duty to take part. When a case involving the right of any private citizen was before it, as in the case of ostracism or banishment, at least 6,000 citizens must be present. In the wider Greek world, ecclesia came to mean any duly convened assembly of citizens. You and I are the ecclesia of God. We're not just simply a uh, a, a group of people that believe something, but we are a group of people that have been given authority to actually move within the laws of the land that we belong to. We are ambassadors of heaven, bound by the laws of heaven and not by the, the laws of this earth. And our purpose here as the ecclesia is to engage in this world in a way that expands the kingdom of heaven, that expands the laws, the rule, the reign of heaven here upon the earth. So knowing this, knowing that it is a convened people, that it is an assembly, a people group, it is very clear on what it is not. There are zero times, I counted them up and I didn't have to count long, zero times that the word ecclesia was associated with a building. The church 
actually has nothing to do with a building. It has everything to do with an assembly of people. Now, knowing that, that also means that this isn't an individual thing if you're part of the ecclesia. You see, if you say that I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm part of a church, but I just have my own personal relationship with God to myself, I like to do, you know, I, I like to do religion on my own at home, then you're not part of the church. You see, part of the church has very little to do with your personal relationship with Jesus in the sense that because ecclesia, in what its true sense, it is only ecclesia by the fact that it is an assembly of believers. That assembly of believers happens to come together in a building, but to call a church a building is to confuse a family with a house. Like, if, if, you're, if you're confusing dinner time as family, a function of what the family does, then we're missing the point. Now, this is vital for our understanding. This is extremely important because not only does it break down and put back the authority upon us as individuals, it, it helps us understand what the Lord's expectation of the church truly is. You see, when we think church is a place that we visit, a thing that we do, that we check in and check out of once a week, then all of our hope and our expectation is upon that place. It's upon the people that happen to be leading the organization where the church is actually convening. You see, what, what happens is then, when we, when we have a misunderstanding of what church truly is, we think that the pastors, when they're not doing what we want them to do, or when the worship team isn't worshiping in the way that we want them to worship, that that church is bad. That there's something wrong with the, the church. But see, it's actually, we're personally responsible for what church is supposed to look like. It's never meant, it was never intended for a people to go and to watch something happen. It's, I just read this. It, it was that each person had not only a duty, but an authority, a responsibility, and a right to enact upon the laws that, that, that it was given, that that assembly was given to walk within. And when we break down this, this us versus them or this, this time of weak reality. This opens up what the ecclesia of God is actually meant to look like, not only in a function of Sunday morning, but throughout our daily life. See, I am called to be the church, and I am called to be the church with a group of people, and that is not meant to be something, as I said, that you check into and you check out of. This isn't, at one moment I'm at church and another moment I'm not at church. Each and every one of us are called to be a part of this group of people. Let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 6. Verse 1 says this, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and we're just going to skip the rest of the names, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now in the modern day church, what we think church is, it is generally accepted that a group of people comes, checks in, and see, finds out what the pastor's doing. Like, that is, that's a very basic, we wouldn't probably say that that's what church is, but it, in reality, that is what the Western church is doing. We are coming, attending, watching, learning, and then going about our weeks. You see, when there is an issue that rose, the apostles didn't 
take on the responsibility to solve every issue. You see, because they understood what ecclesia actually meant. They knew that it was not just them with authority, but it is actually meant to be a shared responsibility for the group to take on the responsibility to care for the widows, not just those that that were the apostles, but that each and every person in the the community actually has a unique calling and a unique gifting. So what they say here is like, okay, I hear that there's an issue. What are you going to do about it? This wasn't rude. This is actually empowering. This is, this is freedom. This is something that allows the people, the ecclesia, to know that they can function in kingdom power. Like, they don't have to wait for somebody else to do it for them. It is their duty and their responsibility to walk in kingdom power and to meet the expectations and the needs that are happening. If you have felt frustration in your heart with the church, if you have seen something that you feel like is not right, I wonder if it's not a call from the Lord for you to be the answer. You see, when we look at church as a place, as a, as a thing that we're supposed to check into and, and check out of, We think then, if it is not needing my needs, then I don't need to be there. But maybe the person next to you does need you there. Maybe it's not meeting what you need, but maybe you are what the person next to you actually needs. This is what I believe is what the biggest breakdown through COVID was. That what it what it exposed is we had the function of church, a thing that we do, the weekly gathering ended, and a bunch of people realized, I don't need the gathering, is what they thought. What they didn't realize is that the people in the gathering needed them. You see, I, I'm, I totally agree that the gathering of the believers is not what makes up my Christianity, but I know that it is important that if I'm saying I'm part of the church, coming together on a weekly basis, whatever that looks like, coming together, in the, in the Bible they give us the example that they met in the temple, they came and they heard instruction, they learned from the word of God, and then they also continued gathering house to house. And when we think that the church is not meeting our needs, we have missed the point on what church is. If it's not meeting your needs, it's because you were meant to be the solution. Those things that you're being, that you're frustrated about. I am meant to be the solution for the things that I do not see are going right in the church. Each and every one of us has a personal responsibility as the ecclesia, as the church, as an, and has not only the responsibility, has the authority and the right to operate in kingdom power. It is not meant for just a few people. It isn't meant for the worship team to be the main source of your worship. We should be worshiping at home on our own. We should be worshiping in in every aspect of our life that we are living. It is never meant to be a few people that are the real kingdom carriers and then everybody else just has to work and finance those people. It's such a twisted way to look at what church is. This is meant, the the well, what we are trying to build here is an apostolic center that is recognizing, equipping, and releasing people into what it is that God has called them to do. You see, we've, we've mistaken function, we've mistaken calling and anointing as the point. Like, like what I mean by that is we've mistaken the gathering, the Sunday morning as the, the whole point of what church is, when this is nothing more than a team meeting. Like, we're just getting encouraged to go out and do church. Like, this happens to be the place where we go, we hear from God. There are, there are people that have been called to equip the saints so that they can go do the work of the ministry. This is not ministry. This is an aspect of ministry, but this is for the purpose for you to do ministry. And when we break, that, when we break this divide down, then our offenses start to dwindle. See, when we realize that when we're not coming to church to get my needs met, we're coming to church so that I can be empowered and equipped to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, then I don't, I'm not upset when things aren't going the way that I want them to go. Because I know I'm supposed to be part of that solution. And what this does is this unlocks what we do all throughout the week. It's no longer work, it's actually calling. 
You see, when we're led, when we think that the whole sum of our life is supposed to be checking into church and then working for the rest of the week, we've missed the point. Then we follow money as our master. When we actually make decisions, when we are working for money and not operating in the calling that God has us, it's going to lead us down paths that are super boring. We're going to lose, we're going to live a life of reason and lose a life of faith. Let me break this down a little bit. If I am thinking about my career, if I am a Christian, and I am, which I am, I happen to, I happen to be a Christian. As a Christian, <laughs> that sounds better, as a believer, as a born again, sanctified, righteous man that is seated in heavenly places where Christ is, one that is the head and not the tail, that happens to, to be a conqueror with Christ Jesus because of what he's done, there's absolutely nothing that I can do to change that. As one of those people. When I think of my career, when I think of what I am doing for my nine to five or whatever that happens to look like for your life, when the primary motivator is money, you'll make decisions based on where money can be found the most. And you may be missing out on what God is saying for your life. You see, not only where money may be the most, but where money may be the most secure. You see, then I start to analyze and I use my reason to figure out, oh, this next step that God has for me in my life, I don't know if my, if my finances, if, if that'll work out for the plan that my family has. I don't know if that works out with the 401k, with what the retirement is supposed to be. And we are gonna miss out on a life of faith. You see, when we actually realize that I am the church and Sunday mornings are a function of the church, but as a member of the church, I am called to be a solution here upon the earth. I will listen to where the Lord has me go and the provision will just follow me. I don't follow the provision. The provision happens to follow me when I'm walking in the ways of God. When I'm walking in the ways of the kingdom, then I start to think about things different. I say, God, what people group are you calling me to? What area of society are they broken? That they need your hope. When we realize that the goal of Christianity isn't to get so spiritual that hopefully you can do Sunday morning ministry. The goal is to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth wherever you are. Then we can start to think like, oh, I know that there are people in the real estate industry that need me. The money's going to follow. I know that there are people in school systems that need to know who Jesus are. The provision will follow. When we break down culture's expectations of what it has for our lives and what our careers are meant to look like and what our future is supposed to be, when we quit listening to all the money gurus and the financial people that are saying this is what safety and success looks like to live in America, get rid of the garbage and start listening to the voice of God where it is that he would have you serve in. You see, I'm, I'm extremely passionate about this because I ha- I, I'm running, aren't I? I'm watching your heads like, I'm sorry, your chiropractor will thank me, though. Like, you got to go back. Look, I just did it again. I'm going to stand here for a second. No, this is passionate for me, though. Like, I feel like so many of our lives are spent trying to figure out how we can get into the leadership teams or how we can be good enough to be used in the church or how, how we can be finally recognized. We go to prophetic conferences hoping to get a prophetic word so that everybody else in the room sees, oh, did you hear how spiritual I am? Now maybe the pastor will listen to me. Now maybe I'll be used because I have been called by the prophet on the stage. Look, this was never the goal of Christianity. You don't want this to be the goal of Christianity. Trust me. (laughs) But when we realize that church is a group of people walking in kingdom power, we start asking God, what and who are you calling me to? There are widows that need to be served. Lord, send me. There are orphans that need to be served. Lord, send me. There are CEOs and businesses that need to be served. Lord, send me. I am the solution. Here I am, Jesus. I'm not willing to sit and wait for my moment to fall from on high. I am taking the responsibility that you have already given me 2,000 years ago upon that cross, and I'm saying yes today. 
This is a different mindset than what many of us walk in here in, in, in America. Church isn't something that we get to check into and get to check out of. And knowing that, then we get to find out what it looks like to live as the church with Jesus. This is when it becomes a really beautiful thing. You see, we, we talk about our identity as sons and daughters. We talk about the authority that God has given me. But how many of you know that as the church, you are the bride of Christ? And now as the church, as, as the bride, with that in mind, I don't get to make decisions apart from the relationship of my marriage. Everything that I do in the decisions that I make in my daily, law, my daily life are held in context with how will this affect my relationship with my wife. You see, when, ch when church, when we understand that we are the church, we are the bride, the way that we live our lives is constantly aware of our connection to the bridegroom. That means I get to make decisions that enhance that relationship. I make decisions that bring more intimacy to that relationship. And not only that, but we know that he is jealous of his bride. Let's, let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Marriage is meant to be this picture of what it looks like for Jesus and his church and the way that we live in intimacy and in deep relationship with one another. It says this, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wives, loves his wife, lo loves himself. Last week, we talked about smoking weed and gambling. This week, we're talking, about, we're talking about our multiple wives. All right. Great. We're doing good. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Look, the whole instruction for marriage was to point to the picture of Christ and the church. This wasn't just instruction on how to have a good marriage or the right order of what a marriage is supposed to look like. Our natural marriages are supposed to show the entire world what it looks like for the church to be in holy matrimony with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The way that we live in sacrificial love towards one another is meant to be a natural expression of what it looks like for each of us as the church to live in union with the king, with our bridegroom. And so with that understanding, we know that he is jealous of his church. And not only is he jealous of his church, he will do whatever it takes to protect her, to nourish her, to cherish her, to lift her up. I thought it was so powerful what Max said last week when, when he was talking about people bad-mouthing other churches. Like, you talk about me, fine. You talk about my wife, we got an issue. This is how Jesus thinks about his church. Don't talk about his bride in a negative sense. This is his wife that we're talking about. Who am I as an individual of the bride to criticize his wife? Last week, uh, my wife was at, Rachel was at a uh, car dealership, and um, she was getting her oil changed. And they had the car up on the lift, and it got stuck. It would not come down from the lift. And so she spent a couple hours there waiting, wondering what the heck's going on. And she finally calls me, and she says, hey, they've got my car, and it's stuck up on the lift, but they said they're going to give me a ride. And so I'm, I'm going to get a car soon. And I said, uh, I don't think that that's what they're saying to you. If they're giving you a ride, that means they're about to drop you and the kids off wherever they, you, know, you want to go. But she had to work that day. She had a busy day. And so I said, you know what? If they don't give you a vehicle, uh, 
Call me and I'll talk to him. Like any good husband would. And she goes, okay, well, I'll go talk to him. And so the guy pulls up the vehicle and she puts in the car seats and she realizes that there's a coffee cup in the middle of the, in the center console. And so she grabs it and hands it to the guy like, oh, you left your coffee in here. And he says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop you off. And she says, drop me off. I have to work today. Like, I need a vehicle. He says, we don't have any vehicles. Well, by nature of being a dealership, that is actually what you do have. Um, <laughs> that's, like, there's like a little something was off with that. Like, that, that's what you do. Like, you, you, you do cars. That's, that's, that is what you have unless, you know, whatever. And so her response was, well, I'm going to have to call my husband then, and he will not be happy. And she picks up the phone and he goes, wait a minute. <laughs> I think we can get this car down any minute now. Look at that. There it comes right down the lift at this very moment. This is the response that Jesus is looking for his bride to have. This is the king of kings and lord of lords that said that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. This is not, we are not in this fight alone. We have been given authority by the bridegroom to operate in kingdom power that the devil would shake in his boots. When, when a problem is coming our way, we say, well, I gotta call my husband. He's got more power than you can imagine. You may have messed with him, you may have nailed him on the cross, but you don't touch his bride. This is what he thinks about you and I. He is desperately in love. He is just encaptured by your beauty. He loves you and wants to see you thrive in success. He cherishes you. He's not nervous of the devil. He's not nervous of your future. He wants you to know that he is in partnership with you. He is not lording you around just telling you what to do. He is a partner in this relationship with you and wants to walk out this life with you. He doesn't want you to be the wife on a Sunday morning. Like just a quick side gig that we check in and check out of. He wants you to be his bride at all waking hours of the day. He is desperately in love to see his church actually walk in intimacy and in unity with him. And he is passionate about it in the same way that we know as a society, a husband says, don't touch my wife. He is in love with you and he is chasing us down. He wants to see you succeed. He's not mad at you. He's not waiting for you to screw up to then smack you over the head. He's cherishing you, nourishing you. He's madly in love, and he wants to walk this life with you. This is never meant to be a thing that we go and attend and that we check in and check out of. This is never meant, imagine my relationship with my wife. We, we, we have a little intimate moment on a Friday night, and we call it a good marriage. And we live in separate homes. I go and work, and I go do my own thing. She goes and works and does her own thing. We meet up, we get intimate again, and then we go on. How dysfunctional would that be? That sounds bizarre to say, but we don't realize oftentimes we live in relationship with Jesus in the same way. We check in, we, we stamp the card, and then we go work. Your work was never meant to be a thing just to, to seek after money, to seek safety, so that hopefully you can get some great vacations and maybe have a good retirement at the end of the day. It was meant to be a calling, a place that you are meant to spread the kingdom of heaven in partnership with the king of kings. He's desperately in love with his church, and he wants to see her in, there, in her fullness. You and I are a part of that. Not alone, not apart from one another, but as an assembly of people. They understood what it meant when he said, upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my church, the ones who are called out of darkness and into the marvelous lights. Those that have gathered together that are walking in kingdom authority, these are the people that are meant to rule and reign here upon this earth in kingdom power. And to do that with hearts of love, to do that through sacrificial laid down love, to show the entire world what it's like to be in relationship with Christ, to show the world how great our bridegroom actually is. It's a call to each and every one of us 
not to take this relationship casually. Look, I am fierce about my marriage. When there is something that stands in the way of my marriage, I will move mountains to get it out of the way to protect this thing. I have done it time and time again. I've just walked through a process of doing it again. We went through two, three months without a date night. And I said, we're changing this now. Like, we will, I don't care about money. I don't care about whatever it takes. I will hire whoever I need to hire to give me more time to spend with you. When we realize that we are in a marriage with the King of Kings, everything else has to take second place. He wants everything else to be second in line to that marriage. And he will move mountains to make sure that it happens. He just wants that surrendered heart to come to him, to stay with him, to not be a casual encounter on the weekends, but a heart that's truly engaged and in love with him. Father, I pray that you would redefine this reality in our lives to where we have taken churches, something that's flipping, where we have criticized your bride. We repent. Lord, where we have thought that this relationship with you is meant to be just a weekend, couple of hours, and then we just go about our own lives. We repent. Lord, change the way that we think about being the church, about becoming this beautiful bride. And Lord, help us understand that it's not meant to be a few select anointed people, but that each and every one of us are called Each and every one of us are given a purpose. So, Lord, transition. Change the way that we think about our daily lives. Change the way we think about our workplaces. Change the way we think about our homes. And let those be callings. Places that we walk in your anointing. Places that you have sent us to, that you have ordained us to walk into. Put money in its proper place. Ooh, I'm going to sit on that one for a second. I feel that there are people that have made decisions, career decisions in here, based upon money. And I want you to know that it's not too late to make a course correction. If you found yourself making decisions for the future based on safety, security, based on reason, there is a higher place to you to, for you to live in to live with a life of faith. So Lord, I pray that if if we are one of those people that have made decisions for our future based on security and safety, and not based on calling, gifting, and anointing, not based on your voice, Lord, we repent from that. And we course correct. We say, Lord, send us to those places that who cares if your family doesn't think it's the, the utmost, most honorable job to work in? Who cares? Because your bridegroom sent you there. That's the only opinion that matters. Lord, let the voices of this world fall out of our ears and let the vo- your voice, the voice of the bridegroom, be the only thing that we hear. Let the opinions of man, the, the things, the expectations, in the same way that the apostle said, look, I understand that there is needs out here, but i got to do what I'm called to do. Give us the confidence to walk in the callings that each and every one of us have been individually given to walk in. That we would make up this ecclesia. That we would make up this body, this beautiful bride. Lord, give us the backbone to say yes when it's before we figure it out. Give us a heart of surrender. We come to you, Jesus, and we surrender these things at your feet. We lay them down. And Lord, where we have taken our experience as a casual encounter with you, we repent. This was meant to be a marriage, a healthy, thriving marriage. So we submit to you again. In Jesus' name, amen.